Right. Our old friends, Michael and Helena, are having one of their periodic encounters. Having argued the toss on Wilde, Shaw and Beckett, they are this time meeting after seeing a revival of Old Times, starring Kristen Scott Thomas, Leah Williams and Rufus Sewell at, where else, the Harold Pinter Theatre. Michael, looking every bit of his 75 years, is in pensive mood. So too is his young friend Helena. They stare lengthily over the pot of coffee that sits between them, before Helena breaks the silence. So is this your favourite pen to play? I find whichever one I've seen most recently is the one that lodges in my imagination. You're dodging in the question. I know you once wrote a book on Pinter, so you must have an all-time favourite. <sighs> You're putting me in a difficult position. I've always loved the birthday party because Pinter uses the format of the rep thriller to create an atmosphere of menace. But equally, I admire No Man's Land for its distilled poetry and Eliot-esque desolation. And there's no better demonstration of the insecurity of the state oppressor than in One for the Road. Cut the bullshit. I'm asking you to name an absolute favourite. Since you insist, The Homecoming. This is the play for me where all the best elements in Pinter combine. The demotic speech, the sexual tension, the ability to invest each phrase and gesture with significance. Each time I see it, it acquires new meaning. In particular, Ruth, who abandons her sterile life in America to settle with her hackney in-laws, strikes me as perpetually fascinating. I guessed you'd say that, but I find something creepily offensive about Ruth. If she's really, at the end, agreeing to become the family's surrogate mother and a Soho sex worker, that's disgusting. And if she's simply using her sexual magnetism as a weapon of control, that argues a very dated idea of how women behave. Pinter's a fabulous writer, but his view of women now looks anarchist... Ooh. Anachronistic. Anachronistic, thank you, to my generation. I've heard that argument before, and I totally refute it. For a start, look at the men in the play, all loners and losers, for all their verbal ebullience. Max, a supposed head of the family, is a bellicose blusterer. The pimping Lenny is entirely routed by Ruth in their first encounter. Joey is a dim-witted boxer with a crudely opportunist approach to women. As for Teddy, Ruth's husband, he seems to regard her as little more than a useful campus trophy. Of course the play is about a misogynist male household that sees women as either mothers or whores. But it would be madness to assume that Pinter endorses that attitude. I hear what you're saying, but you've overlooked one simple fact. At the end of The Homecoming, Ruth is either pituitive, putain, or, mani or a manipulative minx. That's sheer prudery. What we see is a startling territorial takeover. At the start, Ruth eyes up Max's chair. By the end, having made a choice, she occupies the seat of power. Joey, still sexually unsatisfied, is kneeling at her feet. Max is reduced to a wreck. And although Lenny stands behind the chair, Pinter was unusually adamant about the fact that he doesn't exercise control. No Pinter play is ever finally resolved, and we can argue forever about what might happen next. But the more often I see the play, the more it seems to me about a woman who exercises control over a group of hilariously inadequate men whose big cock talk is belied by the reality of their daily lives. You would say that, wouldn't you? I still think there's an element of male wish fulfilment lurking within the play. And what I sometimes hunger for is that beautiful Beckettitian minimalism you find in later Pinter plays like Landscape or the political fury of One for the Road or Mountain Language. This is Pinter still working within the old-fashioned, realistic format. I'd agree with you, it's a pivotal moment for Pinter, the last play he writes that draws on the naturalistic tradition. But like all great dramatists from Chekhov on, Pinter gives it his own peculiar spin. Just look at that nighttime battle between Lenny and Ruth that I mentioned earlier. Lenny tries to intimidate Ruth with two violent arias. Ruth then rattles him, first with her provocative silence, and then by using a glass of water as a form of sexual challenge. That shows Pinter's ability to achieve through a simple domestic object the same kind of big effect that the actors of his youth, like Donald Wolfitt, accomplished through the sweep of a cloak. OK, but you're an old issue dog in Codger. You still haven't addressed my point about the coarseness of this play compared to the sparseness and clarity of later Pinter. Well, that's only because I disagree with your point of view. Pinter always finds a diction that is appropriate to the setting and character. Now here he's writing about a group of men who have mostly lost the art of conversing with women. 
He also makes a distinction between Max, who's an old East End roaring boy on the verge of senility, and his asexual brother Sam, who adopts the polite civility of a professional chauffeur. And Ruth herself has her own distinct tone, mocking at first, legally precise later. But I could go on forever about this amazing play. And I'm sure you will. I'm a great admirer of Pinter. I just prefer him in more lepergery mode or with political fire in his belly. That's your privilege. But Pinter's work is large and various enough to satisfy all tastes. What's crucial is that it goes on being discovered, as it will, by new generations. But it's getting late, and I've neglected my duties. Can I take your cup and give you a drop more coffee? <laughs> if you take that cup, I'll take you. Touché. <laughs> they stare at each other in silence. So, <laughs> thank you very much.